Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole. And on today's episode, we're talking about fun ways to help picky eaters and kids with feeding issues get more comfortable with new foods. If you have a child who has a limited repertoire of foods, whether they have been diagnosed with a feeding issue or not, it can be super stressful because we're feeding kids all day long, it feels like. Um, And I get tons of questions from you all every week about how to deal with various issues surrounding food, eating, and your kids. So today I have invited occupational therapist Sarah Appleman on the show to talk with us about how getting kids to play with food is key to helping them become more comfortable eaters. Let me tell you a little bit about Sarah. She's a published author, speaker, and pediatric occupational therapist. She holds a master's degree in occupational therapy and specializes in early intervention for children diagnosed with sensory processing dysfunction. She co-owned Pause for Peds in Long Beach, New York, and created a handwriting curriculum utilizing a multi-sensory approach to handwriting. In her newly released book, Play With Your Food, Sarah combines her passion of working with the special needs population with baking. Through fun therapeutic interventions, activities, and tips, she guides caretakers and kids to enjoy participation in the food preparation experience with fun games while improving the food tolerance of picky eaters. Can't wait to get into all of these tips and ideas. Sarah, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I definitely want to hear about how you got into OT and feeding issues and all of that, but actually first... I have to know, and our listeners need to know more about the name of your clinic, Pause for Peds. Okay, tell me about this. This was like an animal therapy. Yeah, it's so fun. (laughs) So years and years and years ago, we, uh, I worked at PS 107 in Queens and I was working with a great group of physical therapists, speech therapists, and occupational therapists. And I always wanted a dog, right? Like since I was a kid, I was always waiting for that under the Christmas tree present with the whole, never got it, but that's okay. It's okay. Um, So I always wanted, and I had this passion of like, one day I will get one and train one to work with kids. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did when I was working there and I brought in this uh, puppy and all the kids, you know, we have written permission and everything. And I trained the dog and children who were wheelchair bound, who we've been working on transitioning to get out, were just unmotivated, were climbing out of their chair to get on the ground to play with the dog. And I'm like, okay, we have something special here. What can we do? So I just, you know, left, left the board of ed, went in and I opened up a facility and we had tortoises, we had a lizard, we had PT, OT, speech, behavioral, psychologists, like just a whole gamut. And it was really, to this day, all of my family from there, we still keep in touch and we love each other. And it was, it was a really cool experience. I love that. Tortoises, puppies, yeah. lizards, fantastic. And I know so many of you listening can relate um, to what Sarah's talking about with animals, just bringing out things in your kids. Um, you know, so, oh, that's awesome. Okay. All right. So that was like my first inquiring minds need to know, but let's, let's talk more broadly about how you got interested in doing pediatric OT and specifically like the sensory and the feeding stuff. Was there something in particular that sort of led you down that path? Well, I always loved Ever since I was I was a kid, I loved babysitting and helping out with my mom and the lead. I just had that natural touch to everybody. If there was a fussy baby, they would give them to me, you know, when I was like nine, 10 years old, and I would just be able to calm them. So I knew I had to work with children. Um, and then, you know, I saw struggles within my own family. I had a brother who had some issues. Um, and I was like, I wish someone had been there to cheerlead, you know, like I always joke, I'm a professional loser because I lose every day, every game, everything to build these children's confidence up because it's got to start somewhere. So I used to be competitive, not anymore because I just lose for 22 years. I just lose every day. Um, So I knew I wanted to do something in that field. And you know, I was looking into different avenues, but OT just spoke to me because I was allowed to be creative and, and come up with 
really fun solutions to everyday problems. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was like, that's my, that's my thing. And of course, you know, they always say God gives you, you know, what you can handle, which uh, I'm still thinking about that, but right, me too. Uh, <laughs> so I had my son who was like the emergency C-section. He had visual problems. He had some, you know, uh, tonal issues. He had like a lot. And, and this was something he had with like eating and textures. And we had to come up with fun ways to do this. I mean, he's amazing now. He was like, you know, he's seven, almost 17 and he's a great student. But in the beginning, everybody always said like, oh man, you're a tough baby, tough child. He's like, I know I heard about it all the time. And it, it's interesting, you know, so I had to put my therapy hat on at home and really work with him. Mm-hmm. So this was like, you know, always in the back of my mind to, to create something about, um, something fun, working with kids and letting other parents overcome their child's frustrations and and picky eating. Yeah. And when you've come at it from the personal standpoint, it gives you a whole different perspective on it, right? Like it's easy for us to have, you know, for professionals to have the perspective of what needs to happen. And it's different to be in the parent role and dealing with it with your own child. And so I think it's so great that you have not only the professional angle on it, but also you've been there as a parent, you get what parents are struggling with dealing with this stuff with their kids. And I think that's so powerful. Um, And I love what you said about the, the creativity and the, the coming up with creative, playful solutions to the everyday kinds of problems because whether a child's been diagnosed with something or not, like we mm-hmm. encounter challenges with our kids. Like show me a parent and a kid mm-hmm. and I'll show you challenges, right? Like that's just how, how it is. And, and I love this idea of looking at how can we creatively um, solve mm-hmm. some of these things. And I think when we talk about feeding stuff in particular, so often, um, the idea that people have about what feeding treatment or feeding therapy or dealing with that, you know, needs to look like is sort of this very clinical, um, you know, behavioral type of approach. And, you know, what I have found now in 25 years of practice is while sometimes there's elements of that that can be helpful, where we really get traction is in the everyday moments of what's going on in the home, with food, between parents and kids, like that piece is just so important. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things parents also ask me, they'll be like, oh, I made this for dinner and then my child doesn't want it. What do I do? You know, simple things like that, where I'm like, listen, you know, there are things like I don't eat a certain type of thing or it's hard to find something everybody in the family is very enthusiastic about to eat. But, you know, and that's why when you go to a restaurant, right, you pre-look at menu and you're like, "Mm, what will I get or what will I order? Because you don't want to get there and feel, you know, flustered or, or, you know, hungry and then you get upset. So we all as adults deal with this problem Mm -hmm. every day, you know, and it's like, how do we tolerate it? How do we deal with it? And then what are our expectations for our child Mm -hmm. to be able to to have that high level of, you know, cognitive thinking and and problem solving? (laughs) Like, so we have to kind of guide them as to what expectations are and how can we achieve it in a, in a positive way rather than, well, if you don't eat that, you don't, it's like, there's that, that negative, then you have a control thing and the butting of the heads. And I just, I'm like, it doesn't work. Yeah. That meeting halfway that saying, okay, this is an issue. Let's understand what's going on there. Because I think so often parents just get exasperated. What I see happen with professionals too, where it's like, you just need to eat this. Like you just, this isn't a big deal. You just need to to do this. And we have to really put ourselves in their shoes and understand all of the underlying things that go into a kiddo being able to eat comfortably and to feel safe around lots of different foods and to expand their palate. Um, And and I want to get into that a minute because certainly as an OT who specializes in sensory things, you've got a lot of information to share around how those sensory processing issues impact food intake. Again, whether a kid's been diagnosed with an issue or not, this sensory piece is huge. So I'd love to have you um, talk with us about that. So I, this is one of the biggest things is like, first, I like to always tell parents that 
you know, they associate, there's a correlation between children who are autistic or on the spectrum and sensory processing. And I always say this to them. I say, if your child is autistic or diagnosed on that spectrum, they definitely have sensory processing. But if your child is diagnosed with sensory processing, that doesn't mean right. they have autism. So that's like a, a you know, they're not synonymous. Right. And it's very important for parents to understand that. Sensory processing, plus uh, sensory processing is, um, the ability through your senses to take in your environment, process it, and then have an output, like very simply put. So if you and I are talking and suddenly an alarm goes off or something happens, we're going to put what we're talking about on the back burner and focus on that immediate because we have to make sure for survival purposes, what's the most crucial thing for us to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what it is the problem is when all the bells are going off and you're like is this is this a big deal is this a big deal and like these children cannot focus because their body is reacting negatively toward that sensory input mm -hmm. so if a child hates like you know watching people try on clothing mm -hmm. at stores with kids and it sounds like they're being murdered and you're mm -hmm. like it feels so painful to them because their body doesn't understand what that texture is and it's it's really harmful to them. Mm -hmm. So you're like, what's a big deal? It's just a, you know, a, a sweatpants or jeans. They, they can't process that. Right. So I have to take, I, that's how this whole process started for me was watching that Mm -hmm. And saying, well, of course, there's going to be that positive, that correlation of a decreased appetite and decreased tolerance of smells, touches, textures, temperatures. If they can't tolerate playing with Play-Doh or getting their hands dirty, you know, it's like, I'm dirty, I'm dirty. And well, how are they going to eat? Yeah. So, you know, that's where I decided to come up with this. Yeah. It's a it's a desensitization and fun activity to help guide parents like this could be why your child is reacting that way. So important. Yeah, that processing piece of, you know, really the brain and we take it for granted. We don't think about it. But every second our brain is taking in all of this information from our senses, from the world around us. And it's making sense of it and exactly. so that we can understand it and organize ourselves around it. And like you said, like have a response that's appropriate, but in kids with these sensory processing issues, um, yeah, their brain, it, it, it gets confused. It struggles to make sense of all of this information and it all keeps coming in. The world around them doesn't stop, right? It's like, yeah. it all keeps coming in and the brain gets so overwhelmed. And then of course, the normal human response to feeling totally overwhelmed is to just shut down to it, to avoid it, right? Like we all do that. And I think you're so right that this happens so much with the food stuff, but because that's not our experience of it. We right. don't understand that that's what's happening for them. And so we're like, what's the big deal? Like, oh, it smells like, you know, whatever, or it feels like this. And we don't realize that those sensations, that information is so overwhelming to them that that's why they feel like they can't be around it or put it in their mouth or see it or whatever, because it creates such overwhelm for them. So I, so I think that's really important. And I love what you're talking about here with a strategy being really to help them get more used to that, to acclimate them to it. So their brain can make sense of this information better, right? Cause isn't that, that that's the crux of what we're doing, like with therapy around this, whether it's feeding or any kind of you know, sensory processing work, we're helping the brain be able to make better sense of these inputs. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I also, it's funny because I always do a thorough history. Like when I, when I had switched to my pod, they're like, why are you, why is your report initial evaluation, like four pages? I'm like, yeah. because if you don't get a good enough history, you miss out on right. a lot. So when I first interview and I, and parents are like, why are you asking me to diet if my child has, let's say handwriting issues or whatnot. Yeah. And I'm like, it's all connected. You know, how they sleep, how they eat, how they move. It's all connected. So, you know, one, so many times when I have a kid who's tactile defensive, the parent will all of a sudden, almost like a flashback, be like, oh my God, when I was young, 
or, you know, or when my husband told me when he was young or whatever. Uh, and I'm like, exactly. But we have learned to, you know, to adapt, acclimate to our surroundings so that we could be functional and not disruptive every day, yeah. you know, because if we were like, oh no, I had to cut an orange for my son, I'm sticky. And we had a meltdown as an adult, that would be very problematic. But they would say like, I remember when I was on the soccer team and I didn't want to touch the oranges. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why didn't you want to touch them? And they, oh, well, they were sticky and, and this. And I'm like, well, do you remember any other things? And then all of a sudden, like, they're like, oh my God, you know? Mm -hmm. So I say, look, this is great because it'll help you and your child. Mm -hmm. um, bond grow from it. And that's, and that's the other thing. It's also like, think about it. When I was a child, I didn't eat Brussels sprouts. I didn't eat broccoli. Right. Like now I love it. Yep. So, you know, there's so many things that as you get older and whether it's visual or auditory, you're desensitized to it. And then you try it. You're like, Oh, that's not bad. Oh, that's good. And then you just, it becomes part of your diet. Mm -hmm. But if someone to this day came in and is like, you can't have whatever, if you don't finish your broccoli, I don't know if I would do it, you know, it, right, it's, right. I would shut down. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because the typical behavioral ways of approaching that just assume that the kid is just intentionally saying, no, I won't do this. And I think that's a fundamental shift for all of us as parents and practitioners to understand is I've yet to meet a kid in 25 years of working with kids who just decides, yeah, I totally could eat that. I'm comfortable with it. It's fine. I don't have an issue with it. And I'm just going to make a major fuss about it every day. Like that, that's just not what happens. If a kid is really limited or feeling really, you know, um, scared of, of branching out or putting up a fuss about new and different things, it's like putting that detective hat on to say, okay, what's really going on here? And, you know, what you're talking about is one of those pieces being needing to help them get more comfortable with the sensory aspects of it. Um, and, and I'm assuming this is why you feel like it's really important for us to have our kids in the kitchen with us doing things, you know, from early on, right? Well, that's, and that's like a piece that I want to touch on is exactly what you just said, the differentiation between a sensory processing meltdown versus a behavioral meltdown. Yes. And yes, the behavior, the outcome of a sensory meltdown are going to be those negative behaviors, but it's not like, and that's, an, that's something I've had to teach even new grad therapists where I work in a mentor. They're like, oh, well, you know, these children are just melting down and they need control. And I'm like, no, right. you have to differentiate. Yes, the outcome, if you see two kids on the ground throwing a tantrum, one is they can't process the information and it's overwhelming and they're shutting down. Right. The other one is testing boundaries or whatnot, but they're not, they right. may look the same, but they're very, very different. Right. And that's exactly why I'm like, listen, if you could put your kid, you know, even one-year-old playing with, you know, I tell them developing um, fine motor skills and textures, you put a bowl and have them play with the fruit, wash, wash the fruit to help, um, you know, mixing, you know, pouring, you're developing bilateral skills, working with both hands together, which you need for sports and handwriting and dressing. Mm -hmm. And then you're also prepping them for real, like that's our goal is to create independent children and, and have those skills. So yeah, just bringing them into the kitchen and getting them used to that environment. So they have the sight, smell, touch, you know, everything. Um, it's just very, very beneficial that this is what we do and this is on, I'm helping. Um, and it gives them some control mm -hmm. and uh, makes them feel good to be participating. So, yeah. For sure. And, and I think the other thing that's so great about involving kids in food activities, food prep, cooking, putting groceries away, you know, whatever it might be, the focus is not on the eating. And so it takes some of the fear out of it. I find like when we sit down with a plate or a bowl of food in front of a kid, immediately they're like, okay, the, the thing that is supposed to happen here is I'm supposed to put this in my mouth and right. eat it, which can put up a lot of fear, you know, for a lot of kids, but this having them in the kitchen with us doing things like you said, like cutting or stirring or, you know, putting things away or washing 
the, the goal at that moment, like that's not about eating, that's about doing something else. And so I, I think that that really brings the anxiety down because so many of these kids develop such heightened anxiety around even the idea of having to eat something new. So, so this is like a, a feel safer to them as a way to engage with it. Absolutely. I mean, and that's, that's part of it is like, that's the initial is helping to organize, put things away, uh, and then moving on to the food prep itself. And then if you do that in a fun way too, like, you know, now so many people, thanks to uh, being on lockdown and, and doing stuff, you have like a million different people like, let's see what we could do with blueberries today. <laughs> and like A million different ones to design a pancake, you know, but like, it's true, you know, so if you're being creative and you're throwing that down uh, on the table and you're proud of what you just tried, I mean, pending that the outcome looks somewhat what relatable to whatever it was you were attempting to copy um but if you're proud like look i made this smiley face or whatever it is or a design how people were doing and then you're proud of it and then your kids are enjoying it that gives you as a parent that that pride you know that you know you want yeah you know so it works it works on both sides well and i think that's a really important point about how the parent feels too because so often kids get stuck in really rigid eating habits, partly because of the emotions that we bring to the table with them. Right. And we just get locked into these battles and rigid, like emotional zones with our kids around food and parents, you know, can feel so demoralized. So I love what you're saying that actually playing with food and doing activities with food, not focused on like sitting down and having a meal takes the pressure off the parent too, and allows for us to feel some success around like just engaging with food with our kids without a lot of drama. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's been my fun part is like, okay, what can I do that would work on? Cause that, that's a challenge for me is like, what can I do? Everyone wants a big cookies, you know, or the winter or this, what can I do to make it more fun for yes. both the parent and the child? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so, you know, whether it's fruits, vegetables, cause you have parents, how do I get my kid to eat fruits and vegetables as their goal versus my kid to eat anything other than, you know, dinosaur chicken nuggets right. or McDonald's French fries. Yep. Cause that's like the biggest, the biggest thing that they, yep. and I'm like, Oh no, we've got to, you've got to get away because When your child doesn't digest the food properly in the gut, it affects Mm -hmm. their behavior, attention, their muscle tone, their sleep patterns, their, you know, just everything. So I'm very big on getting them to eat, even if it's only a little bit, but different foods that will provide them with proper nutrition and, and help them. Well, that, that's one of the big things, you know, um, because I talk a lot about nutrition on the show and in everything that I do. And so many parents say, okay, I hear what you're saying. I, I understand now how important nutrient dense food is. I get that nutrition is super important for my child's brain to function well. Um, but then the inevitable next thing for so many of them is, but I, you know, my kid won't eat these things. I can't get them to. And so I think that's where these strategies that you're talking about are so important for all of you who want your child to eat different things and eat in a more nutrient dense way. Um, but you know, you're not sure where to start with that. I think these, these tools are great. So Sarah, I'd love to have you share a few of your favorites, maybe from from your new book or just from your experience. Give the listeners, give us some examples, some starting points of like when you say play with food or, you know, get kids in the kitchen, get them cooking with us. What what are some of your favorite activities or games or things to do? So when I believe in colorful things, right, it's very appealing to our eyes. And for people who are overstimulated, this is not the the one I would start with. But, you know, I love like putting out fresh fruit and different colors. You have strawberries, cantaloupe, cut up grapes. You know, you could visualize how pretty that is to be to say it in your head. It's like very appealing. And I play memory games. 
So you cut, um, you can make it on your computer, print it out. And I literally watched this happen over one of my Zoom sessions. And I'm like, let's try it. You have the book, let's play with it. And so this boy, he didn't eat any fruit. And he has a brother who's older, who was also diagnosed with on the spectrum. And so they, the two of them were there and he, if he matched, we started simply if he matched the strawberry or match a cantaloupe or match whatever apple he got to eat it and of course the key is putting at least one thing in there that they like to eat because you don't want to have them just oh my god there's all this new food um so i had them he matched it and you're like yay you won Mm -hmm. you want that's a positive Mm -hmm. wow look okay now you take that strawberry you don't have to eat it smell it lick it play with it you know whatever um and then as it kept going their excitement of oh my god i got a match Mm -hmm. was that association so that's one of the most my favorite games to start because it is fun and pretty i've done that uh as candy land too where Mm -hmm. i just have the whole so if you have a board game and they land on a color they could choose one, you know, two of the colors are out and they could pick which one they would like to try. So you could have different color, you know, um, apples, you could have different, you know, grapes, you, could, you just put it out there and it's, it's fun. They land on it. What are you going to try? What are you going to eat? So that's, that's right off the bat, just getting them used to. Um, so the new stuff, cause I just spent four hours in the kitchen again, which I didn't think I'd be doing, but I did, uh, coming up with a bunch of new activities and, because I play games, right? Like, yeah. like all the time with kids. Mm-hmm. So one of the um, things I did is I cut a pear and I used, I had a kid help me put grapes onto a toothpick mm-hmm. on the, um, on the pear and made it look like a porcupine. Mm. And that's something that I play a porcupine game where they have to pull out for fun. I'm like, oh my God, we could do this in food. Yeah. So we did that and they could peel off and eat the grape or whatever. And you could also do different things. You could do blueberries, raspberries, it doesn't matter. But that presentation of a porcupine and them making it, Mm -hmm. they're looking at it, they're touching it, they're smelling it. So by the time it's time to maybe eat it, Mm -hmm. they're more likely to try that. So those are like just some fun ideas that I use. You know, then if you want to get more advanced, in the kitchen, one of my favorite that everybody loves homemade pizza. Mm-hmm. It's very tasty. It's really not that hard because you could either get pre-made dough or you can make your own pretty quickly. Uh, the rolling it out and the pinching of the crust, um, the tolerance of... Um, so I had a boy who I did this with. He hated flour. He did not want to touch it. And so I said, don't, that's fine. Just sprinkle it with a spoon and then roll it out. And of course, over time when you're rolling it, because you know, like that moment, that stop where you're like, no, you have to touch the flour. No, it will naturally get dirty as he's rolling it and touching it. He's going to get it natural without even realizing it. So don't, you know, don't put that pressure. I said, fine, you, you have control. Use a spoon, sprinkle it on, roll it out. And as he pinched, he noticed, he's like, oh, I have flour. I'm like, yeah, see, no big deal. And then I always tell parents to have ready, uh, like a wet, yeah. hot towel, you know, so yeah. they could and give pressure to each finger as you squeeze and pull so it helps calm them. Mm-hmm. Oh, after a few times of that, of that massage, they don't care anymore. They're like, they're okay. It's very calming for them. And then we make pizza faces. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could use different vegetables or different things around that you want to make a happy face, a sad face, have your child make something and then you have to copy. Mm -hmm. So they're getting again, that control. So that's one of their all time favorites is, um, is pizza or the fun, uh, fruits, vegetables. And I love it. And, you know, I'm thinking as you're talking about the game stuff, like, for all of you listening, you've got games probably that you play with your kids, um, board games, yeah, whatever kind of game and thinking, just even thinking about how you can incorporate food into it, right? Exactly. Like that's what's coming to my mind is like, oh, can you use different types of food as the tokens on the board? Or can you use it? Like you said, the game of like, um, you know, using tweezers or your fingers to pull things off and put them in the, you know, container. Can you make something out of food to do that with like how thinking about the stuff you're already 
doing activities and games that your child already likes and feels comfortable with? And how can you work some food items into that just to get that exposure? I think that's such a great idea. It's fun too. Like I, I play a pizza stacking, a pizza uh, pancake stacking game, and you know I use it. I'll have put the pancakes on one side. I think it's called pancake pile up, and oh, you yeah. look at that visual cue, and then what's on the bottom, what comes next. So it's organizing, but it's also great for five motor and balance, where the kids have to use their hand to hold it and I'll have one on one side and one on the other. And then I'll say, "Mm, look at all these different types of pancakes. What would you like to try? What do you think? And then they'll go home and they'll make pancakes and then they'll stack them so they could draw out their own card at home and it could have chocolate chip on the bottom and strawberry or or blueberry or, you know, banana. Mm -hmm. And then they could play that and someone could say, well, I, I, you're talking about integrating auditory processing, right? So, or if they're old enough to write, well, on mine, I would like two chocolate chip and one banana. So they have to like, you know, either draw it or write it and then copy that. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a whole lesson plan in making someone else breakfast. So there's a lot you could do. Well, and that's, you know, when you're talking about that, it's making me think of just what I talk with families about all the time of the benefit of having kids cook with you. Yes, there's the food exposure and there's all of that. But as you mentioned earlier, there's also the life skills development. And then we can talk about all of the other skills with that too, like reading and writing and math. Like to me, having kids in the kitchen with us and cooking is like one of the most um, beneficial things from making good use of our time and energy, right? We have to do it anyway. There's so many skills and benefits that come from it. It's like hitting so many different areas with one activity and it can grow with kids too. Like, as you said earlier, for a young child or developmentally young child, they might just pop in and out a minute here, a minute there of helping to pour or stir or whatever, but older kids can help you actually like sequence through the recipe. What are we going to need next? Get out everything that we need, have them do it. And so I just, I think that having kids in the kitchen, just it's, it's valuable for so many reasons. And I always tell parents, I'm like, you know, I get it. I work, right? We're, we're multitask like all the time between doing household chores and taking care of kids and our jobs. And I get it. So I also say like, do it on a time where it's going to be not stressful because if you're stressing or you're worried about making this and getting the kids out to school, that might not be an ideal time to try this. But if it's on a weekend or if it's on a day where you know it's slower and you're home with the kids that's a good time to have a positive intervention of of whatever you want to try without feeling stressed or anxious yourself so you know it's a great point because yeah like weeknight dinner hecticness is not the time to have your kid in the kitchen with you probably so yeah um that that's an excellent point um I want to go back to, you know, what you said about the playing the games and some things like that. And I, I have worked with parents long enough to know that with the best intentions, one of the things that parents tend to go wrong with, and I've seen professionals do it too, is entering into activities like that, thinking that the, the thing that constitutes success at the end is that the kid ate the items. And I just want us to really touch on that a minute because that is not necessarily what constitutes success. And if we go into those things with that as the only thing that is going to allow us to feel like this was worthwhile or a success, we're actually creating more problems, right? So can you, can you talk about the, all the different ways that success can look depending on the kid and their issues with, with those activities? I mean, that's, that's a great point because I find when you're in the situation day in and day out, that it's hard to really, like I set goals, right? I come in, I do an evaluation and we talk about what are your child's goals. And if a child has low muscle tone or poor coordination and they can't even self feed, they can't hold, they can't pierce the fork into the food, right? So 
these are things that you need as a parent to say, well, what, what is the outcome? What do I want to achieve? What are my goals? And set realistic. Here's another thing. If you're doing, you know, uh, that's why I love what that show nailed it, right? Oh, I find okay. it hysterical because that's how so many parents who are not artists yep. um, feel you know, like you expect me to create what with my child? And mm-hmm. that's like I said, creating more stress and anxiety. Right. And then what do we do as we're going to avoid it yeah. as adults? We're not, we give right. up. Yeah. So the most important thing is to set realistic goals, may, be aware of what your goals are. Mm-hmm. So if your child has that low tone and pouring is an issue or, you know, to build up their strength mixing or, um, I, I even have, like, I tell parents, even before you could get them into the kitchen, like doing simple tasks, get out those Play-Doh. I'm a huge advocate of Play-Doh because it is textured. It is scented. They could make pretend food. Um, and kids love it because again, they're not going to eat it. Um, and it's going to work on a lot of those skills mm-hmm. and look at how they watch. It's also not just the outcome. It's how the quality of movement and the quality while they're doing it is. So if you see that your child is struggling to cut, you know, Plato when they should be able to easily, uh, you know, a one-year-old versus a Mm three-year-old and you're like, oh, you know, maybe I need to work on that first Mm -hmm. and then come back into the kitchen and, and, you know, work on whatever you're working on. So you know, it is really important. I'm not saying bringing your kid into the kitchen and like magically they're going to tolerate right. flour. That's part of what I would about is desensitize them even before you get them into the kitchen. Right. So if you know they hate flour, start with, again, Play-Doh, kinetic sand, mm-hmm. make your own, like that's an easy test, flour, water, mm-hmm. cornstarch, water, food color, you know, just anything that you could do and make mix it um, and that'll carry in because then you could do, okay, let's make pancake batter. Very similar. Yeah. Or, or cake or cookies, something that they do like, but they'll be able to tolerate it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah. So start with the proper course of what your goals are, how to help them along that way and bring them in for that, that outcome. Out, yeah. You know, and product. I think, you know, it, that's so important. The breaking down of that, because our ultimate goal might be the end point goal might be, yeah, for, for them to, let's say, eat a blueberry or eat a piece of melon or eat a green bean. But there's going to be a lot of steps for some kids leading up to that. And so to your point, yeah, being aware of what's my what's a realistic and appropriate goal right now. It might be that we're just going to Um, get comfortable with sticking blueberries on the toothpick to make our animal. That is success right now because look, he was uncomfortable with even being around the blueberries or initially he didn't even feel like he could touch them. And now he's able to pick them up and put them on there. That's a huge success. And I, I think it's so important for parents to look at those things as wins as opposed to going, well, but you know, he still didn't eat them. And it's like, no, but that's down the line, like celebrate and focus on all the intermediate goals, because if your child is a super picky eater or has feeding issues um, and you're the only thing that's going to constitute success to you with an activity or a therapy or whatever is, did he put it in his mouth and eat it? then that's a big problem for your kid and for you. So I I love what you're saying about break it down and recognize all those intermediate goals that work up to the Mm -hmm. goal we all have for our kids, right? Which is to comfortably eat a varied diet. (laughs) And I think that's, that's definitely like when I sit down with the kids, let's say you just say green beans in my head. I'm like, what, what do we think? It looks like grass trees, you know? So you make your little mashed potato pile, right? And you could put, oh, stick these in it. Oh my goodness. Look at something as simple. And then you come over. We used to do this all the time. We're like, oh, I'm going to eat the tree and get strong. Right. And like, take a little bite. See if they copy you. Great. If not, you're enjoying something that they created with you. And then maybe the next time you introduce it, they're going to be more likely. And that's a, that's a thing also I always say, don't, it always goes on their plate. So if you're sitting at the table and you're not going to give them a huge mound of vegetables, but you're going to give them maybe one, 
Mm -hmm. one or two pieces and it has to be on their plate do they have to eat it no but it has to be there so that it's close to them they get used to it they visually see it and then you do that for a number of days so you could have like like a tiny piece of broccoli doesn't matter over and over and over Mm -hmm. after a while it's not threatening to them it's not you know they see it they're fine you can even create different fun things where it's like Okay, here's that piece of broccoli. Mm, I don't know what it tastes better with ranch dressing, with cheese on it, with a hollandaise. You know, oh, look at all these different pretty dippings. I'm going to lick that one, you know. And so it's just introducing it again, not here, eat this, you know, pile of broccoli. But how would you like to eat that? What do you think goes good with it? That's right. And that getting them acclimated because the more, what, what that's really doing, you know, is allowing their brain to start to make better sense of how it looks, how it smells. And when our brain can make sense of something, we're not scared of it anymore. Right. And so this exposure allows the brain to make sense. And, you know, some of you might be thinking, well, my kid would totally melt down even if I put that on their plate. Okay, then start with it in a bowl on the table, you know, uh, that that you progressively get close to them, however you need to do it and wherever you need to start. I think the point here is if we never expose kids to things that they're uncomfortable with in the realm of food, we can't expect that they could ever become more comfortable varied eaters because we're not giving them any opportunity for their brain to be able to process that information better. So there has to be some level of exposure and maybe you have to start with it sitting all the way across the table and it gets closer and eventually it's on their plate. Like whatever you need to do. I would do, I would give them more power. Like let's say you're working on squeezing, right? So you get a big thing of tongs and you're like, okay, you don't have to eat it, but help hold it. And then let's put it on everybody else's plate. Yep. Great. So they're, they're forced to at least participate in dealing with it, having everybody else eat it. Mm -hmm. And then Oh, okay. If they do that a couple of times, like I tell parents, have your kids at the table, have them pour the drinks, yeah. have them put the ice cubes into the cups. You yeah, see, there's- I think it's that issue of helping, you know, finding that sweet spot of where it pushes them a little bit, um, right. but not so much that, that, you know, they just shut down to it and, you know, can't handle it. And that, and that can be tricky, but this idea of, you know, using, particularly as you're talking about fun activities, things that they already enjoy and figuring out how can we bring some food into it. I I think that that's great. Um, I know that we have to wrap up here. So I want to make sure that um, you share with people where, uh, tell us a little bit about the book, where they can find it, because it's a great book with like lots of pictures in it and, and great ideas. Yeah. So uh, it's called play with your food and it's on Amazon. And the play with your food book is the Instagram and we're doing all because I get asked a whole bunch of questions now. So we're doing, um, you know, uh, common questions that I'm asked and I answer them. Um, And then we're working on like other means and stuff. So I have a TikTok. I think it's just Sarah Appleman (laughs) um, where I show like how I do some of the stuff, how I create simple things, very simple stuff. Mm-hmm. that's fun. So we're, we're going to be uploading all those. We have free handouts. We, we don't, I don't believe in, you know, when parents struggling, I just want to help. Yeah. So I just give, like, we do free handouts. We do free blog, you know, all this stuff is for free so that parents can learn um, more about their child and how to make those improvements. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's just a fun filled, really, great way to understand sensory and how it impacts on eating. Can you, um, what's the website? Because I know I went to your website and you've got lots of great downloads and things to play games and all of that. So what is the website? The website. Okay. So there's going to be a change, but it was a play with your food book.com. Okay. Um, but I know that there was, um, like a third party handling it originally. And then there was like something weird. Okay. So now we're going to be revamping and redoing it. But for now, I think that's still okay. present that, that they could do that. So people go to play with play with your food mm-hmm. Okay, great. And that's the title of the book. And then your Instagram is 
Play with your food book. Play with your food book. Okay, fantastic. Right, so so keep it all simple. That's right. Um, and in the book, it, it's filled with lots of ideas, right? So those of you looking for specific activities, if you're like, okay, I understand you know, what I want to accomplish here, but I am not creative. I don't know what activities I can't come up with the games. That's what this book is, right? Lots of activities and specific games and things that you can do with your kids around. Food. Yeah. Like I'll show for, I know it's um, not, but like, let's just say like the introduction also talks about um, the entire, you know, um, reason why I made it, how I made it, and then a little bit about sensory so they could understand it better. Yes. And then each thing, like I'll just show for this. So like each thing, let's say fruit kebabs, right? So yes. taking out fruit, making cute things. Uh, it tells you what you need, right. how it directions, how it helps, and then a therapeutic tip. Perfect. So, and then there's also a note section. So you could say, my child like this, didn't like this, or right. this worked or this didn't. So it's like a guide for the parents to be able to, to do you know, it, it's their own workbook on it. Awesome. So yeah, there's there's lots of fun information, lots of fun activities, lots of recipes. It's a recipe book, you know, too. So it has like pretty much everything you'll need. Fantastic. Because I know so many people are like, okay, give me some activities. I'm not creative. So this, so this is your, your helper with that. So definitely go check that out. Sarah, I really appreciate um, just all the work that you're doing in your career uh, around this. It's such an important topic and important issues. And uh, thank you for spending time with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thanks as always to all of you for being here and for listening. We'll catch you back here next time.